Welcome back. This is week four, lecture one, the great schism and reform in head and members, reformation in head and members. Um, this lecture is one that is continuing the series of lectures in the section of this course on the Reformation of the Later Middle Ages, or what can also be seen as the crisis of the Later Middle Ages. And we've talked about famine, plague, war, poverty. Um, we talked about the rise of pastoral care and the attempt to reach the people in this ongoing uh, fight between God and the devil. We talked about this crisis being uh, one where everything that had always been assumed was the case was seemingly no longer the case. I mean, what do we do about it? And this great schism, as it's called, was a cataclysmic event. Uh, scholars have even argued that it should be the uh, demarcation between different periods of history, the pre-schism and the post-schism. Um, that has never caught on in terms of actual uh, actual periodization. But we need to see it in those terms that Christendom pre-schism was very different from Christendom post-schism. And we'll see some of those effects in later lectures um, and the impact that this had on the mentality and the understanding of scholars and also regular people within Christendom in the later 14th century. Now just as a footnote, um, the term the Great Schism, it should really be called the Great Western Schism to be precise, because the Great Schism, there's another term, the Great Schism, uh, took place in 1054 between the Latin Church and the Greek Church. That's too has re been referred to as the Great Schism. So just don't be confused because this has in some ways absolutely nothing to do with that first schism between the Latin church and the Greek church. This had to do with Christendom itself. When Christendom became split, causing questions of what is going on. How can this happen? Now to look at th these events, we need to then go back and start with the papacy in Avignon referred to as the Avignonese Papacy, which I think I've uh, talked about a, a bit before, in terms of, of Clement V moving the papacy to Avignon, uh, and then John XXII officially and thoroughly establishing the papacy in, in Avignon, um, and some of the conflicts that cause. I think I already mentioned Augustinus of Ancona in his uh, comprehensive treatment of ecclesiastical power, some of the Potestate Ecclesiastica, which he wrote for John. Also, to warn John of the limits of paper, papal power, argued that theoretically the Pope can live anywhere he wants because the Pope is the head of the universal church, the Catholic Church. Catholic just means universal. And yet the Pope is also the Bishop of Rome. And as the Bishop of Rome, the Pope necessarily had to reside in Rome. And here was John XXII living in Avignon. So there's tensions there. How did this all come about? What took place and what do we make it of all and what impact did it have later on? Well, the Avignonese papacy, um, aside from the theoretical aspect in terms of can the Pope live outside of Rome? What does that all mean? How do we deal with a Pope who is technically, let's say, um, uh, not necessarily a heretic, but in terms of the condemnation of non-resident bishops which had been there since the reforms of Gregory the Seventh in the late eleventh century, whereas bishops were then designed supposed to be living in their diocese, and here the Pope wasn't. What do we have that? So all these tensions surrounding that also led scholars to to critique the Avignonese papacy to refer to it simply as a puppet of the King of France, which it really wasn't. But the perception was there that it was. And I think I mentioned, too, already that Francesco Petrarch, the father of humanism, referred to the Avignonese papacy as the Babylonian captivity of the church. Now, again, I think I've already mentioned, uh, we'll see that term come up again, the Babylonian captivity of the church, um, in one of, the, of Martin Luther's favorite, famous treatises of 1520. Now, what does it all mean? People were clamoring for the 
papacy for the Pope to return to Rome. No Pope did until we get to the end of the 14th century, 1377, and Gregory XI. So, okay, I'm finally going to go back to Rome. And Gregory makes the effort. He moves back to Rome and dies. Bummer. So there has to be a papal election. Papacy, just as the emperor, as I've mentioned a few times, was an elected office, an elected position. It was not based on dynastic ties, even though there were dynasties thereof. Um, and, and the family politics certainly was a major factor in papal elections. But the theory was not that um, the emperor or the pope was an office that you could simply pass along to your son. And of course, as a pope, you weren't supposed to have offspring. That did not prevent popes from having offspring and papal nephews and nieces out there running around were well known. Everyone knew they were the offspring of the Pope, um, but they were just referred to as the papal, <laughs> the papal nephews and, and, and nieces. Now, so that had to be an election. The College of Cardinals elects the Pope. It gets to be a problem with elections. We're not the first political entity, meaning the United States, not to have problems with elections. Supposedly they're democratic, but all kinds of influences enter in in factionalism and money and power and trying to coerce people to vote the way that you want them to and it gets to be a real mess. And this election took place in 1378 within Rome there was a highly charged political atmosphere with demonstrations, threats of violence, the Roman people clamoring, give us a Roman Pope, give us a Roman Pope. And if not a Roman Pope, at least an Italian Pope. Let's get rid of these damn French. There's political tensions between the French and the, and the Italians. Now, again, at this time, there was no such thing uh, as a political entity referred to as Italy, but the Italian peninsula was, Italia was known as Italia, and there were a number of city-states ruling uh, within Italia, um, and then the Kingdom of Naples was in Italy, March of Ancona, so there's different political entities within Italy, but the idea that, that there was something uh, that was Italian a geographical area and a language uh, was very much present and a cultural kind of sharing in terms of what did it mean to be Italian. Uh, so there's a sense of give us an Italian Pope, or if you can, probably, uh, preferably a Roman Pope. Because Pope should be Roman, he's Bishop of Rome. And the College of Cardinals got there and they said, okay, you know. We're kind of afraid of the crowd. We better come up with somebody. And they did. And they elected a man whose name I don't know off the top of my head. They took the name of, of Urban VI. A Roman Pope. So, yay! Great! All celebrated the election of Urban as Pope. Problem was, the French cardinals, and there was uh, a major faction of cardinals, were French. And one of the things that John XXII did in terms of being an Avignon, was he expanded the Cardinal College of Cardinals, the number of people who became cardinals. And we have to keep in mind, too, to become a cardinal is simply the uh, papal appointment. You, It's not an office that you uh, can progress to. You, you, you probably should be a priest. Necessarily. I don't think you had to be a priest, but you should be an ordained priest. So there were, you know, there were also another could be also could be a deacon. There could be a cardinal deacon. Um, so you had to be some level within the, the church administration. Um, there were cardinal deacons or cardinal bishops or cardinal archbishops, um, cardinal priests. So the College of Cardinals was this kind of almost a representative body of the church hierarchy. 
and we'll see later, the, the council, the general council, is seen as a representative body of the whole church at large. But the College of Cardinals then had to get together to elect the Pope. And they elected Urban. But with the increased percentage of that college being French, thanks to John the Twenty Second, the French cardinals said, you know, we were coerced to vote for Urban. These damn Romans and Italians were, you know, protesting, threatening violence and everything else. That's not a valid election. So what we're going to do, we're going to go back to Avignon and elect the Pope. Because the election of Urban wasn't valid, because it was an election under duress. And we've seen that before. That was the theory behind the election of, of Louis of Bavaria and Frederick of Austria. The theory that a coerced election is not a valid election certainly was there, just as it is today. So, that's what they did. They went back to Avignon, and they elected a man, man whom I don't know uh, his name off the top of my head, but took the name of, of Clement the, the Sixth. So we have Urban the Sixth in Rome, and we have Clement the Sixth. No, excuse me, Clement the Seventh. Sorry, in Avignon. Um, Clement the Sixth was an earlier. 14th century Pope, actually the one um, that uh, did Petrarch pr pretty well. Anyway, um, so Clement the Seventh, so Urban the Sixth and Clement the Seventh. Now, there had been split elections before. There had been, you know, anti popes. I already mentioned that Louis of Bavaria marched on Rome and proclaimed John the Twenty Second, deposed and established um, um, Nicholas V as Pope supposedly two popes the so-called anti-popes Louis of Bavaria's pope anytime there was a previous disputed election never really stuck they never really had the support sufficient support to make stake their claim that's what made this time so different because both Urban and Clement had sufficient political support and backing that they both kept their legitimacy in their own minds as being valid and viewed themselves as the legitimate pope. And Europe politically split along those lines. Just think about it for a minute. If you're French, if you're the king of France, are you going to support Urban or are you going to support Clement? Uh, that's kind of a no-brainer. You're going to support Clement. If you're an Italian, one of the Italian city-states, whom are you going to support? That too is a, kind of a no-brainer. You're going to support Urban. What if you're English? Who are you going to support? Well, you're going to support Urban because you're not going to support the French. We've been fighting the French for how many centuries now? This is still technically within the period that historians have referred to as the Thirty Years' War, so we're not going to go with the French Pope. So we side with Urban. If you're the Emperor, whom do you side with? We, too, are skeptical of, uh, of, of the French and their pretensions to supremacy. So we are going to support Urban. If you're Spain, at this time, uh, Aragon, uh, uh, and Castile, because Spain didn't come about until later. But the Kingdom of Aragon and Kingdom of Castile, who are they going to support? They're going to support the French. Um, Portugal, the French. It all gets very messed up, and there was sufficient political support for both popes that Europe split politically, and both popes believed they were the, the legitimate pope. Now, this is a problem, is it not? Because what do you do if you are urban? You're urban. You're sitting there in Rome and you believe you are the legitimate pope. There's no Supreme Court 
I mean, the Pope is the Supreme Court. There's no place to appeal beyond the Pope. So when you have two Popes, to whom do you appeal to settle the issue? No one. Now, Urban believes he is a legitimate Pope. What does that make Clement in Urban's eyes? It makes him a schismatic. And a schismatic was worse than a heretic. A heretic, theoretically, you could teach. Show them the, the ways or the errors of their ways and their false beliefs. And they could then not be a heretic. They could be brought back into the fold of the Orthodox Roman position. If you're schismatic, that is splitting the church. What do you do with those? Well, you counter them the way you can as Pope. You excommunicate them. So Urban excommunicates Clement. Now, what does that mean, too? Theory was, if a leader is excommunicated, king or prince, Everyone within the jurisdiction of that ruler was not necessarily excommunicated technically, but was under the ban. There could be no sacraments in those territories. So if you're urban, you excommunicate Clement. That means in France, um, in, in Aragon, Castile, in Portugal, anybody else that supported Clement, there could be no sacraments. No baptisms. That means no more babies. If they died, went straight to hell. No last rites. That means if you're on your deathbed, you don't get absolved from your sins. You may not go directly to hell, but you're going to be a lot more time in purgatory than you would have had. You can't go to Mass. You can't receive the Eucharist. Mass can't be celebrated. Marriages can't be celebrated. No one can be ordained or confirmed. No one can go to confession and have their sins absolved. It's a very, very dire sentence, if you believe. And everybody did, basically. Except for the Jews. So, that's what Urban did. Now, if you're Clement, what do you do? You believe that you're the legitimate Pope. And that Urban is the schismatic. So you excommunicate Urban. That means anyone following Urban is under the ban. No sacraments. So everybody in the empire, everybody in England, everybody in Italy, basically, except maybe some of the French, but that gets to be a different issue. Devon, Naples, and Sicily, there's a French connection there. So that's... Anyway, everybody was under the ban. No sacraments. Every, all of Christendom lay under excommunication or the ban by one pope or the other. Now, if you're just a regular person, how do you deal with this? How do you know which is the right pope? You know what your you know feudal lords are saying, what, which ones they're following, but what do you think or believe about all of this? You don't know. Now, if you're you know king of France and that you're excommunicated by Urban, who in your eyes is a schismatic, so what? Because a schismatic has no power or authority to excommunicate anyone because they're excommunicated. So it doesn't matter on that level. And vice versa with people following Urban. So what? That Clement's excommunicated. That has no effect whatsoever. But for the common people. Scary. It's full of anxiety. Because they knew, too, the scriptural passage, those that eat unworthily, referring to the Lord's Supper, eat unto their death, coming from Paul. So if you are under excommunication knowingly, and you knowingly flaunt that and partake of the sacraments and go to Mass and have communion, that's bad. And it's bad for your eternal salvation. What do we do? 
were over this split was like the seamless robe of Christ was split in two. That was what happened in, in, in the crucifixion. And it hadn't happened since. And now Christendom had been ripped apart. What are we going to do about it? How do we come up with a solution to solve this problem? So from 1378 on, it was a matter of grave discussion by scholars at universities, by the you know, bishops, archbishops, pri the priory generals of the orders, because they too split. So with the Augustinian orders and the Franciscan order and the Dominican order, they ended up having two prior generals. So everything was split along the two lines. Oh, how do we handle it? Finally, the theologians and churchmen got together, canon lawyers, and said the only possible way to handle this is to have a church council. We'll call a general council. There haven't been one since Boniface VIII called for one in 1302. Not all that successful or powerful. So we'll have to get together a, a council. So they do. They proclaim it in, in the to be held in the city of Pisa in 1409. Now, this solution, this solution to settling the schism, became known as conciliarism. There have been other options put forward, things tried. They said, okay, what we'll do is just go and approach both popes and say, will you please resign? Um, you know, Celestian V resigned, so it was it became established that resigning is possible. So if they will both resign, who okay, we'll just go back and make sure we have a valid election and only elect one pope. Whether it's, we do so in Avignon or Rome doesn't really matter anymore because we just need to have a single head of the church. Because without that, we don't have power. In some ways, this is a somewhat crude analogy and certainly not one used at the time because I didn't know about it, but it's like the whole circuitry of the church had been cut off. So the Pope is the circuit breaker because we have Christ, the power source, and then the Pope, and then the rest of the church. And if you take out the papacy, how do we have that power? The power of Christ is gone. It's one analogy. Now, the problem as such with what do we do with no Pope was had been discussed because Popes die. And be, and so the period between the death of one pope and the election of another is a period without a pope. You've seen that uh, with the you know, election with John the Twenty Second. You've seen that with the election of Celestine the Fifth, even where there's you know a year, two year gap before the next pope was elected. The theory was developed also by Augustinus of Ancona, in an earlier treatise, not in the Summa, but in an earlier treatise. That what happened was that the power of the papacy resorted to the College of Cardinals. Now, this was a theory that has been called uh, root and branch conciliarism, but it's, that's a very much a misnomer. Because according to Augustinus, the relationship between the College of Cardinals and the papacy with respect to uh, the power of the papacy was the same as the, the relationship between the roots and the branches of a tree. So that's what it was called root branch. But he pointed out what is the power of the roots? The power of the roots are to grow branches. What are the power of the branches? To bear fruit. So that even though the power of the papacy, which this whole point was to bear fruit, resorted to the roots in the College of Cardinals, it was a very limited papal power. 
It was the papal power only to elect a new pope to grow a new branch that could produce fruit because otherwise you don't have any fruit. That's it. So this idea of root branch conciliarism is really kind of a misnomer because th this has been a problem even if not formulated the way Augustinus had formulated it had been tacitly recognized all along. Pope dies. College of Cardinals elects a new Pope. So the idea was, you know, we have to somehow get the council together. We can elect a new Pope if we can get both to resign. <sighs> Didn't happen. So I said, well, that's what we have to call a, a general council. And from this point on, we start talking about the development of conciliarism. Conciliarism as a theory of church governance. I'll talk more about this shortly. I think I've already mentioned this kind of feeding forward, so to speak, in previous lectures, talking about the political theory and, and issues involved. Um, and it was very short-lived, but it was the idea that the council has the authority to govern the church. And it pees that that's what it was. We get together, we'll elect a new pope. And that's what they did. And I think it was Benedict XII or something like that. I forget the name of the pope they elected. The problem was, Europe split again. And the Pisan pope had sufficient political power to, to be claimed to claim for himself legitimacy. So now we have three popes. The Roman Pope, the Avignonese Pope, and the Pisan Pope, all with legitimate claims to legitimacy. Pisan Pope said, the church council elected me. Oh my God, it was now a three-headed monster. The body of Christ. They realize, okay, conciliarism, a general council is the way to go. We just didn't do it right. We have to go back and do it right and get rid of this problem once and for all. So in 1414, with the help of the Emperor Sigismund, supporting this endeavor, making it possible, the Council of Constance met in Emperor Sigismund, because Constance is actually kind of lower southwest Germany, Switzerland, is part of the empire. The Council of Constance did a number of things when it got together nearly five years after Pisa. So, okay, we're not going to elect the new Pope yet. That was the problem of Pisa. They did not deal with the schism. They did not deal with a the theoretical aspect behind it. They just was hoping that they would elect the new Pope and the other two would, you know, capitulate and resign. Officially or not. But that wasn't the case. So what we need to do is to establish the authority of the council as the highest authority within the church, and we will then depose all three popes. And in their decree, Haec Sancta, also referred to sometimes as Sacro Sancta, it's this holy synod just council. They proclaimed the theory of conciliarism, which was the highest authority in the church is the general council. So it goes rather than going from Christ to the Pope, to the council, to the church, the power and organizational chart goes from Christ to the council, to the Pope, to the bishops and archbishops and to the people. So that the Pope becomes kind of the, the CEO, whereas the council or the board of directors, where the real power lies. And we can argue, okay, to what extent does the board of directors or the board of trustees have the power and the Pope just, or the CEO just works for them? Well, yes and no. All right, that's not the point. The point here is that in that structure, that's how it was seen. 
That was the theory that they put forward, that the highest authority with the church is not the papacy. It's the council. Radical departure. And this decree, Haik Sancta, proclaims that. And then they said, okay, we're going to issue another decree, referred to as a frequence. Just is the Latin version, uh, or the English is the Latin, is the Englishization or transliteration of the Latin, because this means frequency, or frequent. Frequent is frequent. And it determined that we're going to take care of business here in Constance. When we're done, there'll be another general council in five years. When that council is done, there'll be another general council in seven years. When that council is done, there'll be another general council in 10 years. And then there will be a general council every 10 years to make sure the church is in good shape and take care of all the problems and issues that come up, to validate the Pope and how the Pope is governing. It will be a good system. It will make sense. Because they were, why don't they have a general council every year? Well, because it's a major, major undertaking. Who comes to a council? Every prince, at least theoretically they can. Every prince within Christendom. Every abbot, head of the monasteries. Every prior general, head of all the friars, uh, the, the, the Medican orders. All the archbishops, all the bishops, all the retinue. And they descend on a city. They have to have provisions for all those people. The logistics of bringing that all together is huge. <clears throat> and we have some of the lists uh, from Constance of what was required and needed, which includes you know, a, a, a list uh, of prostitutes. We have to have so many prostitutes to take care of people. Yeah, no, this is not about morality. The church has never been about morality until rel relatively recently. Um, but the amount of practicalities involved in the council, because it's food, it's wine and beer and prostitutes and entertainment of other types, all have to get together. They have to have a place where they can talk about it. They have to have, be able to get together and have discussions. It's a major, major event. So it can't be every year because that means you know people are in constants. They're not. You know, if you're king of England, you probably won't go. You'll send somebody in your place. And so there's, it's not a good situation to be in. You can't practically have Christendom and the governance of Christendom if you're always having a church council. So that was why they have, they said things are in such a dire state. We're having constants. We'll set things in order in five years. Things will need to check in because things are not very good right now. And the overwhelming slogan that was put out there, the call and the need in light of the schism, was the urgent need for reformation in head and members. Not just with respect to the papacy, but with all of Christendom needs to undergo reformation. And that was the task of the councils. Now, after proclaiming these two <sighs> decrees, Exancta and Frequence, they said, before we elect the new pope, we're going to take care of business to set the church straight. And one of the threats that was there was the increasing rise of heresy. And there was a very worrisome movement going on in Bohemia. King of Bohemia was, was one of the seven electors. Zygismund, who was emperor, was king of Bohemia. Um, because there were a group of people who were following this university master, the University of Prague, um, who was preaching and gaining large, a large following. And his name was Jan Hus. He was arguing that the church was for the people. It's like for for the celebration of mass, um, everyone should receive both the 
wine and the uh, the bread, both the cup and the bread, the body and blood of Christ. I think I mentioned before it was traditional that that was not the case. Um, it was only the priest who took the, the, the cup. And he also was arguing some of the doctrines in terms of the structures of the church that seemed to undermine the authority of the papacy, funnily enough, as did the schism itself. But based on uh, an English theologian uh, of, who'd already died uh, named John Wycliffe, but who had died but had raised all kinds of problems and issues, seemingly undermining the authority of the papacy, um, based on an Aristotelian view of political structures. Um, and Huss seemed that he's just following Wycliffe. Now, we do an analysis of Huss's treatise on the church, De Ecclesia, and Wycliffe's treatise on the church, De Ecclesia. There are some parallels, but the amount of borrowing of Huss from Wycliffe was far less than it often is asserted to be. And part of the followers of Huss also started to proclaim bohemian independence. They wanted to be independent from the emperor, from the empire. So this is a region that later became known as Czechoslovakia, and then the Czech Republic today. Um, this Czech nationalism was a rising threat to the empire, to the emperor. So there's both political dimensions and, let's say, religious dimensions and theological dimensions. So they said, you know, we need to talk to Master Huss. A lot of stories going around about what he's advocating and preaching. Yeah, we know a lot of people are using his name to support their positions. We're not really sure if that's what he thinks or not. So we need to ask him to come to the Council of Constance to kind of, you know, explain himself. So they send him an invitation. Master Huss, please come to the Council of Constance. We'd like to talk to you about your teachings at the University of Prague and your preachings, popular preachings, because they are becoming very popular. And Huss, he was a brilliant man, he was like, I'm not going. I can smell, you know, problems. And negotiation went back and forth, and finally, Emperor Sigismund said, Master Huss, we just want to talk to you. I will guarantee you safe conduct to and from the council. Which meaning he would say imperial troops will protect you. Okay. On that basis, I said, okay, I'll, I'll come. So, with imperial safe conduct, Huss traveled to Constance. When he got to Constance, rather than just talking, there was fierce preaching against him, and several Augustinians um, distinguished themselves in their preaching against Huss, but they certainly weren't the only ones there was outcry and he was condemned as a heretic basically without a real hearing now the issue was do we let him go back to prague no he's a condemned heretic as a condemned heretic you're not entitled to safe conduct ergo we burn him and Huss was burned at the stake of the Council of Constance. Supposedly, he said, well, you may burn this goose. And the term, this is a play on words, his name in Czech, Hus. I don't know Czech, so I can't verify this, but Hus, also meant goose. So you may burn this goose. But a swan is coming, whom you will not be able to touch. It's a prophecy. A swan is coming. A reformer is coming. You're not going to be able to touch him. Huss was burned. 
Yeah, they even dug up the, the bones of Wycliffe or had the bones of Wycliffe dug up and they burned those too just for good measure. After doing all that, after taking care of a number of other Reformation issues that they had to deal with in terms of the administration of the church itself, they then only at the very end, 1418, they're ready to close up shop. So now we're finally going to elect a new pope. Elected Martin V as new pope. So okay, very good. We have done our job. We have ended the schism. We have put the church in good order. We brought about a reformation in headed members. And we put, provided the structure to ensure that this will continue. So in five years, 1520 or 1423, we'll meet again and see how things are going. Thank you very much. And that they do. And they close up the shop, say goodbye, and Martin V is Pope, and Martin V says, yay. I have at least five years. And starts trying to regain papal privilege. So in five years, after 1418, it's 1423, and the council met at Siena. The General Council came to Siena, got together in 1423, and after a couple of, you know, sessions talking about how things were going, everything seemed to be going just fine, so they close up shop in 1424. There we go. Next council, seven years. It was five, seven, ten, 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 ten. Um, did meet in the city of Basel, in the Swiss city, part of the empire, 1431. The pope at this time was Eugenius IV. Just as Martin V had tried to start regaining papal authority and papal power, Eugenius just continued that even more so. And he didn't like this idea of the council and being subservient to the council. And he had uh, an ace in his pocket, so to speak, if you know that analogy. He negotiated a way to regain the Greek church, to bring about a unification, not just of Latin Christendom, but of all of Christianity with the Greeks too. And a delegation from Constantinople went to Basel. Now Constantinople in 1430s was in a precarious situation. Still under increasing threat from Islam and the Turks as they became known. The Turks. And so this was a way of saying, okay, how can we form an alliance that we can all be in this together? Because we do have that common enemy. It's the infidel out there. So whatever problems there might be between us in terms of the date of Easter and whether or not in the creed we should say, you know, the, the filioque the statement, the, you know, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, um, or just the Father. <laughs> we still believe in the Trinity. It's just the inner Trinitarian dynamics we have a difference of opinion on. Some of these things that led to the Great Schism of 1054, can we heal that and come together because far more dangerous is the threat of the infidel and the Turk and Islam out there. So they sent a delegation to Basel. And Eugenius, who's presiding at Basel, They take care of business. They deal with a number of issues within the Latin church. And they end up proclaiming officially reunification with the Greek church. This is a treaty. The Greek delegate, the Constantinople delegation, the Greek delegation, um, signed it and agreed to it. It included recognizing the Pope as the supreme authority within all of Christendom. Now, this was a, a big deal because for the Latin West, this was wonderful. It was almost like the prodigal son coming home. It was like, we're all together now. Yay! And Eugenius had pulled this off. And he pulled it off so well that he could even move the council in 1439 um, 
to to Florence and then to Ferrara, and they all followed him, with some exceptions. There are a number of council fathers, as they were called, who were seeing what Eugenius was doing and opposed it. He's trying to reclaim papal authority. They said, we're not going to follow you. You don't have the right to proclaim that the council is going to move. We are going to stay here in Basel and finish our business. Eugenius said, fine. And the whole council moved to Florence and then to Ferrara with the Greek delegation going with them. Now, interestingly enough, too, it was this Greek delegation coming to Basel that some of those members who had come to, 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 to attend the council, participate in it, ended up staying in Italy. And so they stayed to teach Greek. They stayed, and this is the beginning, really, of the, of the flourishing of Greek in the West. Not that it was completely unknown, but this was a major issue in terms of the Renaissance ideal. This was a big step forward. Where it was the, in Italy anyway, not just the Latin, the classical Latin, but then Greek too. So, after kind of doing, moving the council and winning on that front, except for what was referred to as the Rump Council of Basel, the people who stayed in Basel in opposition to Eugenius, um, they closed up shop in 1439. So, council was over. The Rump Council of Basel stayed on for another year or two. But no one had the stomach for a new schism. So the powers that be in Europe followed Eugenius, not only literally to Florence when they moved, camp, moved the council, but they supported his authority. Why, too? Because Eugenius had orchestrated the reunion of the Greeks and the Latins. And the Rump Council of Basel, just that was a Rump Council of Basel, and they said, okay, fine, bye, bye, bye. Then what happened? The delegation that had come to Basel that had signed the reunification, went back to present what they had done to the patriarch in Constantinople. It's like, what? We have to recognize the supremacy of the Roman bishop? Absolutely not. And the deal fell apart, and Constantinople falls to the Turks in 1453. On the west side, the Council of Constance, or the Council of Basel in Florence Ferrara was very successful. Eugenius was back in charge. So when would be the next council? Should have been um, 15, 1446. Seven years, I think I was there, but it's actually 39 when it closes. Um, 14, 1446. No council. 1449, 10 years, because now it was five years, seven years, and then 10 years. 1449, no council. 1459, no council. 1469, no council. 79, nope. The next council was in 1512. We'll be talking about that when we get there. We're over already in 1462. Pope Pius II issued a bull, which is known simply by one word. Exacrobolus. Now, exacrobolus is a term that, too, we have that word in, in English, execrable. It is a very strong word, a very strong word. And what he does, what Pope Pius II does, who is it? An Italian humorist. <sighs> he condemns conciliarism. He condemns the appeal to a council. Only a pope can call a council. In conciliarism, this period of conciliarism, from 1414 with the Council of Constance, we can even, if we go back to 1409 with Pisa, okay. But in terms of the theory of the, of the council being the highest authority within the church, from, you know, Hyke Sancta in 1415 to 1462 in Exocromos. 
that was the period that there was conciliarism. After that, it was heretical to appeal to a council above a pope. Only the pope could call a council. And if you're calling for a council, unless the pope says, okay, which popes would never do, it is illegitimate, it is being schismatic, and it's going against the papacy, and you can be excommunicated and damned for it. That is going to be important for us shortly in this course. Now, I said the next council was the Fifth Lateran Council in 1512. We'll come back to that. Uh, which meant from 1512 to 1517, but that puts us into a different connotation. And there were problems with getting that called too, and the Pope only called it in 1512 because Emperor Maximilian I was threatening to put together a council themselves. So here we have it that politically the Pope called for a council, even though he had resisted being requested to do so, in 1512 to avert the legitimacy of the imperial call for a council. But we'll say more about that when we get there. This is before the Lutheran period. It was issues still with the Turks, uh, with the state of Christendom and everything else, but we'll come back to that later. Now, the question we may say is, why, why did it not take off and why did it not work, conciliarism? I talked a little bit about this uh, previously. Uh, the same reason that Marcellus of Padua didn't take off in his treatise in Defender of the Peace of 1324. European monarchs did not like conciliarism. Why? Because the theory places the representative body ahead of the monarch. There was Parliament in England. There was the Estates General in France, and there was the Reichstag and the Empire. These are representative bodies, supposedly, or advisory bodies, representative bodies, that served at the pleasure of the king. If all of a sudden those representative bodies were proclaimed to be above the king, where the king served at the pleasure of the Parliament, He's like, no way in hell. We're monarchs. I'm based on God's ordination. I'm ruler. And so, even though it, conciliarism was supported to end the schism, politically, the powers that be in Europe sided with the papacy because the Pope is a monarch, papal monarchy. So, that's like, they're almost fine, great. We're back to the way, finally, the status quo ante, as it said, the, you know, the status quo before the outbreak of the schism. Thank God, because that serves our interests, too. And fine, let Pius II condemn conciliarism. We would condemn it, too, and let's just hope to God that we're not needed again. That's the inherent problem with conciliarism. But there was this brief period, less than 50 years, where the theory was that the council was the highest authority in the church. But that failed to take hold. And that brings up the next slide, which is calls for reformation and the failure, the failed reformation. And I've already mentioned Huss and the Hussites. The Hussites were the followers of it. So Huss, um, even though the council burned Huss, um, they did capitulate somewhat to the Hussites. There were two kind of factions of Hussites, the Taborites and the Utraquists. The Utraquists' primary concern was that we should all, the laity, should receive communion of both kinds, and it was called the cup and the bread, or the wine and the bread. The Taborites were the more nationalistic, separatist, nationalistic movements. They were still condemned, but the Utraquists were accepted, they said, and also given the, the privilege to say, fine, Go ahead, you can celebrate in both kinds. Just be careful. So there was this sense. That was fine. 